Excellent. Well, thank you so much to all of you for being here tonight uh, for this great talk by uh, Amy Gusick, who has a lot of experience in the Channel Islands broadly and will give you a fascinating rundown of, of her research tonight. Uh, over the last year, I've had the privilege of meeting many of you that are here tonight. Uh, if I haven't, I hope to in the near future when times are safe and, and we can do that. Many of you look out over the Channel Islands from your homes. Many of you have visited the Channel Islands in the past. Uh, some of you are lucky enough to have visited the Santa Cruz Island Reserve uh, in the past. I was lucky enough to visit the Santa Cruz Island Reserve for the first time about 21 years ago uh, as a high school student. And uh, I took a, a summer field biology class and I got bitten by the islands. And uh, after that, I jumped at every opportunity I got to go back out to the islands through my bachelor's degree, through my master's, through my PhD. Um, for my, my doctoral dissertation, I worked in extremely remote areas in East Africa, uh, getting a lot of experience in these kinds of remote field settings. But every time I was back in the United States, I found myself back out on Santa Cruz Island. And I am completely honored to be in the position of director of the Santa Cruz Island Reserve and it has been a very interesting year. It has been a productive year, despite COVID. Uh, we've gained a lot of momentum that has been stalled and started again. But uh, I look forward to the future and I look forward to, to what we're going to accomplish at the Santa Cruz Island Reserve in the near future. For those of you that might have been to the reserve before, you might recognize the field station. Uh, when you get to Santa Cruz Island into Prisoner's Harbor, you drive about three and a half miles and you are in the central valley of the island at the field station here. You, you woke up there and you looked around, you would not know you were on an island, uh, but it is a warm, inviting place. So, so much research happens here. Uh, we have thousands and thousands of user days every year of people uh, conducting research, engaging in class activities, and looking at the beautiful scrub jays, of which here's an endemic Santa Cruz Island scrub jay. My daughter, Nora, has named this guy JJ. He's very tame and will land on your head without you even realizing it. Um, the, the Santa Cruz Island Reserve Field Station has been around since 1966 and formally in the natural reserve system since 1973. Uh, and we have a lot more to do. We, we've taken this time of closure for COVID. We are slowly reopening to essential research now uh, with small groups in a safe setting. But we've taken this, this uh, opportunity to give a little facelift, do some maintenance that needs to, to happen and that we can do without as many users there. And we are excited to welcome back everyone uh, just as soon as we can. We've had a lot of, of uh, research continue to happen uh, despite COVID. Uh, and we look forward to, to welcoming back the research that has uh, been canceled because of these closures as well. We've had Oh boy, things uh, ranging from uh, field biology and ecology classes from all over the United States, uh, from, from colleges and universities all over the place, to art classes from UCSB, to world-class research on uh, paleontology, archaeology, ecology, um, uh, lots of entomology, botany, all kinds of different research. And we've, we even have um, other students, we, we're going to host an Eagle Scout uh, going out to, with his troop to help eradicate some invasive plants out on the Christie Beach. So we look forward to, to hosting all those groups in the near future. This is a picture from the Ridge Road, the, the more Southern uh, Ridge on Santa Cruz Island. And here you see the fog coming in, which is usually dramatic, uh, but also a very, very unique characteristic of Santa Cruz Island. We're interested in monitoring the fog patterns to look at how uh, different fauna, um, including the Santa Cruz Island spotted skunk, uh, that adorable little guy there, and the iconic Santa Cruz Island fox, uh, adapt to these different ecosystems from the, the high and dry to the lower and moist ecosystems in these fog um, forests. And also the, some of the botanical uh, fog adapted species like bishop pines. Um, if you've been out to the island of Bishop Pine Forest, which is at its southern extreme um, in terms of its range, has been suffering, doesn't look good. And the, the question is why? What, what kinds of conditions are changing for that? 
So one of the things that we've really accomplished in the last six months is working with our partners, including the Nature Conservancy and the National Park Service and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and the Navy uh, to begin work on a regional climate monitoring system. We have uh, eight new weather stations that will be going online and providing open access data in the near future. And this kind of regional approach to research and even remote research uh, really bodes well for the future and for, for studying the unique ecosystems in the Channel Islands and applying that to conservation more broadly. I look forward to, to hosting many of you at the field station and to hosting many more events like this on the mainland to get everybody involved. If you would like to reach out to me, I would be more than happy to talk to you. Um, my email address is here. You can also find me on the Santa Cruz Island um, Reserve website. It's a very easy one. Um, my phone number is plastered all over there too, so feel free to reach out to me. If you have any questions for me, feel free in the Q&A. Uh, at the end, um, uh, Dr. Gusick and myself will both answer any questions that you have. Uh, and with that, I'm going to give you a little biography of our uh, guest speaker tonight, uh, Dr. Amy Gusick. And Dr. Gusick is the Associate Curator for Archaeology at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. Uh, prior to this, she was an Assistant Professor at CSU San Bernardino and Director of a Graduate Program in Applied Archaeology. She earned a Bachelor's Degree from Seton Hall University and her Master's and PhD from the Archaeology Program at UC Santa Barbara. Her doctoral dissertation investigated behavioral adaptations and mobility at the onset of human occupation on Santa Cruz Island. Dr. Gusick is an environmental archaeologist with extensive experience in island and coastal archaeology. Her research interests focus on human environmental dynamics, the development of maritime societies, peopling of the Americas, and hunter-gatherer subsistence and settlement. Her current research projects uh, look to understand how indigenous maritime societies along the Pacific Rim adapted to changing environments and landscapes. She's currently working in Southern California and in Micronesia. She uses both terrestrial and underwater archeological methods in her research, which has been supported by the National Science Foundation, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and uh, the National Geographic Society and the American Philosophical Society. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Amy Gusick. Thank you for being here. All right, well, thank you so much for that introduction, Jay. This is really, really great. Um, I am really quite honored to be here, um, you know, uh, kind of kicking off this, let me actually get to my, oh, there I am. Let's get, let's get past that, there we go. Um, so I'm really honored to be here tonight, kind of kicking off this speaker series for the Santa Cruz Island Reserve. Um, the reserve has really been absolutely instrumental for me in my research. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't know what I would have done without it, let's just, let's put it that way. Um, I have, uh, first time I went out to Santa Cruz Island, I think was in 2005, I studied with Dr. Mike Glassow at UC Santa Barbara, so Santa Barbara alum. Um, Glassow worked out there for many, many years, as I'm sure many of you know and know him. Um, he introduced me to the island and I basically fell in love with it um, straight away. Um, I did focus the majority, I did actually all of my dissertation research on the island um, and was just blown away by the, the UC Reserve, by the Santa Cruz Island Reserve and the staff, um, Lyndall and Brian and now Jay have just been so kind and um, just giving of their time and support. And it's really just been a wonderful, absolutely wonderful place to work. When I'm not on the island, I miss it. When I get stressed on the mainland, I think about how badly I'd like to go back out to Santa Cruz to de-stress. Um, it really is my happy place. So I am very fortunate, I feel, to be able to still work on the islands. I do actually work on all eight of the Channel Islands, um, but Santa Cruz definitely holds a special place in my heart. Um, so um, I, without further ado, would like to tell you a little bit about the research that I have been doing out there. It's, um, you know, as Jay had mentioned, my, I, I really am interested in understanding um, kind of broadly maritime cultures adaptations, um, specifically to kind of island environments, um, and understanding how uh, um, human groups kind of react to different kinds of climatic changes, climatic stressors. And I, I, a lot of my work does focus in the early Holocene terminal Pleistocene because this is a big time of environmental stress um, in a number of areas around the world, particularly here, um, which I'll get into. Um, so that is kind of the basis for my research and it does take me um, certainly all over Southern California. And I do also work in Micronesia a little bit at a later time period, but still looking at impacts from things like sea level rise to understand initial, um, initial occupations. Um, 
So uh, let me find the, there it is. Okay, so um, just to make sure that everybody knows where we're talking about, I'm assuming since everybody is on, on here, you probably already know where Santa Cruz Island is and are familiar with the uh, Channel Islands in general, um, but I guess I just shouldn't assume anything. Um, so the uh, Channel Islands are a series of eight uh, islands in an archipelago, the Channel Islands archipelago. Um, and you can see the Northern Islands there, San Miguel, uh, Santa Rosa, Santa Cruz, and Anacapa, and then the Southern Islands, Santa Barbara, Catalina, San Clemente, and San Nicolas. So as Jay was talking about, and as uh, many of you know, the islands themselves are really, really wonderful places for so many different kinds of research, um, and particularly for a lot of biological research, I mean, certainly archeological research, um, you know, geology, marine biology, I mean, really any kind of science you can dream of, uh, you can pretty much do on these islands, particularly on Santa Cruz. Um, and all of these, these, this kind of biodiversity that you have on the islands, these, you know, these great fisheries, these shellfish beds, the, the massive amount of, of sea mammals and pinnipeds you have around these islands, um, all sorts of birds, seabirds, um, all sorts of uh, aquatic plants, um, the, the giant kelp forest you have around the islands that just harbor a, a great diversity of different kinds of, of marine life, as well as uh, seagrass, um, which was used um, very, very early in time um, for different kinds of, um, by humans very early in time for different kinds of, uh, making different kinds of lines and things like that. Um, to the terrestrial plants on the island, which were extremely important, um, are important to the ecology of the island certainly today, um, also important to helping um, kind of sustain those populations that we do have, we did have on the island in pre-contact times, as well as the, the fascinating geology on the islands and the amount of tool stone that was available for human populations. So all of these things really kind of come together to make these islands, particularly the northern islands, really kind of a, a hot spot for habitation. Um, and that, that has been borne out um, in what we know about the archaeology on the island. So these islands are a wonderful place to study maritime adaptations, maritime resources, um, you know, use of maritime resources um, and development of technologies for kind of maritime hunting um, for hunter-gatherer groups, um, because there has been a continuity of habitation on these islands from at least the terminal Pleistocene, at least 13,000 years, all the way through to historic times when, you know, some of the last individuals that were on the islands were pulled off and forced into the missions. So you have this just absolutely fantastic stretch of of culture history on these islands um, and thousands and thousands of archaeological sites. So this image here is actually um, one of the sites that I worked on for my dissertation. This is on Santa Cruz Island and this is called Punta Arena and you have kind of Gull Island there in the background which is on this, the southern part of the island and just to kind of show you the, the massive scale of some of these sites on the island that entire you see the, the people there that are kind of down there in the in the, the, the lower kind of central right part of the picture there that's for scale. That, that's me and some of my colleagues that are out there excavating. This is for some of my dissertation research. Um, and that entire area that's on top of there is all a big, big shell midden. Um, so this is just an absolutely massive site um, that really kind of spans the, the Holocene in terms of its, its occup occupational period. Um, and then you have some kind of images there of a shell fish hook, um, as well as a, you know, a close up of some of this kind of the density of some of the midden sites out there. So the amount of material in these sites is just absolutely massive. Um, and so, you know, you have large sites like this, but then you also have much smaller sites that are just, you know, shell lenses, um, you know, small lithic scatter sites. So really runs a gamut of the types of sites you have out there. Um, but really, really a fantastic place to work because of this, um, just, you know, the amount of, of um, sites that you have out there. Um, and also um, what's really kind of great about it too is that you can really try to understand this continuity of maritime traditions. So for someone like me that's really interested in maritime societies, having a place to work where you have this long-term, this deep time, um, deep time data that focuses on um, maritime adaptations, you know, not only from 13,000 years ago, but all the way up into current. So we can actually even think about these kind of continuity of maritime traditions, even through to today with the uh, modern day Shumash through the descendants of um, some of them are descendants from um, the peoples that first inhabited these islands. So you have here, you know, kind of an artist rendition of a, a pre-contact um, uh, Shumash in a sewn plant canoe or tamal. And this kind of tradition is still carried on today um, by, by some uh, Shumash members who actually do um, paddle over in this same technology. So this is really a fascinating place to be able to work um, and to really see these, this, this kind of continuity of maritime traditions. 
Um, and so, you know, I, I, I mentioned this, this, you know, the, this really long kind of occupational sequence, which as far as we know at this point, started out at about 13,200 years ago. Now, I think there's a lot of us that think that it probably started out before this, um, but as of right now, the earliest date that we have on the islands, on the Northern islands actually comes from Santa Rosa Island. Um, and it's Arlington Springs Man. Um, so it was a, a femurs that were identified, um, as you can see where that the red line kind of goes over all the way down. I think it's about 13 meters down below all of that, all that sediment there um, that were discovered. And um, they've been dated in a, a context that dates to about 13,200 years old. So you have this continuous occupation from that terminal Pleistocene all the way through to the, to the historic period, which makes this a really great place to work. And it also firmly kind of cements the, the, the islands into a context where you can think about how did they play into um, understanding the first peoples that migrated into the new world. And so this is one of the topics um, that I'm actually particularly interested in in my research is thinking about you know, not only how people uh, adapt to kind of climatic changes, sea level rise, you know, these types of things that have a, a big impact on how people kind of migrate um, around the world, um, but also, you know, how this impacted people coming into the Americas, what's now North and South America. So understanding kind of the timing of this, um, the routes that were taken, um, and really just the manner of this migration um, in, into the new world. And so just as kind of give a, a little bit of a brief um, introduction to this, just in case um, people aren't familiar with this, is there's a couple, or there's a number of different migration theories um, that have been proposed for how people migrated into the new world roughly 13,000 years ago, 13, 14,000 years ago. Um, one of the first theories was the land bridge hypothesis, also known as the Clovis first theory. And so what's really fascinating about this time period is, is these, these uh, migrations into the new world um, were, have occurred after the last ice age. So around 20,000 years ago, you have these, these ice sheets that are covering the northern part of North America, and they begin to melt at about 20,000 years ago. Um, and uh, that water that is caught up in those ice sheets um, is now starts to flow into the ocean. So you start to get sea levels starting, starting to rise at this point. Um, as these ice sheets start to melt, they actually open up. There's two sheets that go across the northern part of North America, and they actually kind of open up in the center um, right where you see that orange line for the land bridge hypothesis. Um, and they open up what's called an ice-free corridor, essentially, that would allow people to walk through that down into the kind of northern part of, of North America. Um, and also the, the area that is kind of off of Alaska, the Beringia area was above sea level at this time because all that water was caught up in those ice sheets. So it would allow people to kind of walk across this, this land bridge and down through the ice-free corridor. So this was the kind of prevailing theory for quite some time. Um, and it made sense because a lot of the initial sites that were identified um, in the Americas really kind of conform to what you may think about when you think about these people coming down, you know, through these ice sheets, um, possibly following a, a migration, these kinds of megafauna. Um, you have large fluted points. Um, you have areas where you have kill sites with, you know, bison, extinct species of bison. You have you know, mammoth and mastodon um, sites as well. Uh, so this really kind of put forth this theory of this big kind of man the hunter um, theory that, you know, really kind of made sense with the prevailing thought um, at the time. But, you know, as, as research started to advance and as people started to think um, and about kind of different, different um, manners of um, kind of migration around the world and started to do, uh, started to find more evidence around the world that pointed to use of aquatic resources, people started to really think a little bit more about, well, you know, how, how early did we use aquatic resources? Are, are they important in our kind of early development as, as humans in general and in our, in our migrations? Um, and we, we know that they are. Um, and so, you know, marine resources, we have evidence of marine resources dating older than 100,000 years ago that have been discovered in South Africa, Mediterranean coast of Europe, kind of sustained use of, of aquatic resources. Um, and then one of the big things that we know about is that Australia was, um, was um, inhabited roughly, actually now it's about 60,000 years ago. I feel, like, I feel like almost every day there's a new discovery down around, that, down around Australia. Um, that's kind of pushing the, 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 the initial um, occupational sequence up further back in time. And to get to Australia, you had to have a boat. Um, so we know that people had a way to um, you know, cross, do an ocean crossing as early as 60,000 years ago. So we know that, you know, that, that the, the knowledge of the sea and knowledge of seafaring, knowledge of some sort of kind of nautical um, movement um, was something that we had you know, even 50,000, uh, 50, 60,000 years ago. 
as you start to move closer over into um, North and South America, you also start to get evidence of this, um, of um, sites that are, um, you know, uh, around the same time period that you're, we're thinking about this initial migration into the new world. Um, and so people started to kind of propose the specific coastal migration theory. And this was a number of years ago, really kind of in the seventies, it was initially proposed. But once people started to kind of really kind of look for sites along the coast and think about that, you know, maybe these um, these marine resources would have been important early on, would have been important for kind of these early people's moving and movement around the world. Um, and once we started to focus on, researchers started to focus on looking for early sites on the coast, they started to find them. Um, and so you have a number of sites that are located along the coast that show um, likely evidence of boat use, though we don't have boats that date this early in time, um, you know, boats that date to 13, 14,000 years ago, but there's indirect evidence from um, being able to access offshore islands that were not connected to mainlands. Um, you have evidence of marine resource use. You have different kinds of technologies, so you don't have those large fluted points that are associated with this kind of inland migration. Um, and one of the big kickers to um, the Pacific coastal migration hypothesis or the model um, was the discovery of Monte Verde in Chile, all the way down at the tip of Chile there, you can see in the, the kind of bottom part of that picture, dating to about 14,000 years. So the idea was, well, if we have the sites that are, you know, 13,200 years old, you know, up in the northern part of, of North America, how in the world did people get all the way down to the tip of Chile um, in within that same amount of time? <clears throat> when the ice-free corridor may or may not have been open. So that really started to open up thinking about these different kinds of past and the Pacific coastal migration model. Um, so you now have, um, as you can see on there, the Northern Channel Islands really fit kind of firmly within this model and being one of the important places that we can start to think about and look for evidence of these even earlier um, occupations um, that are um, happening um, that are um, consistent with the Pacific coastal migration model. So, the Northern Channel Islands now really have thousands and thousands of archeological sites. So aside from um, being great places to look for these kinds of early habitation, they have thousands and thousands of archeological sites dating back to 13,000 years old, dating back to right around that same time period that we start to see these, you know, right around the same time period, um, we start to see this, these sites that are kind of popping up within North America. You have this record of human environment interaction and ecological change through time. This is really trans-Holocene record, which makes it you know, a wonderful place to work. It also has one of the most dense groupings of early Holocene sites in the entire New World. Um, so you have over 100 paleocoastal sites that are located on these islands. Um, and paleocoastal sites are defined as sites that date between about 8,000 to about 13,000 years old. So right within that time frame. So all of those red dots that you see on the, um, on the islands here are sites. So you can see there's a lot of them on San Miguel, a good amount on Santa Rosa, a little bit less so on Santa Cruz. Part of that is because um, the islands have been, um, the particularly San Miguel and Santa Rosa, um, particularly San Miguel has been, um, uh, was a really big focus for trying to look for some of these early sites. There's also a lot of um, erosion on the island that could probably uh, influence archaeological visibility to find some of these early sites. Um, but, you know, once um, there's been a number of researchers who have started to work on Santa Cruz and have started to really kind of, you know, use their finely tuned eye, particularly a colleague of mine, John Erlinson, has really done a lot of research now on Santa Cruz and really kind of using his very, very finely tuned eye um, to um, really start to identify where a lot of these paleocoastal sites are located. Um, so we have a lot more sites now um, on Santa Cruz, and this is really starting to become a bigger part of the picture. Um, in terms of trying to find more and more of these sites. So, you know, while we have over 100 paleocoastal sites that are dating to this kind of 13,000 to 8,000 years old, we actually have 31 sites that date to 11,000 to 13,000 years old. That's a lot of sites that date to that particular time period. Um, 11 of these sites have actually been uh, radiocarbon dated. Um, so they've with, um, you know, been able to carbon date um, shells that are um, in situ. Um, and 20 of them are actually dated with diagnostic technology. So the kind of technology that we have in these sites um, it are not these Clovis points, are not these fluted points that are associated, in the, associated with the Clovis culture, with that kind of inland Paleo-Indian culture. Um, but we have our early sites that are characterized by stem points and crescents. Um, there's been a lot of, of talk about this, a lot of um, kind of research into looking at this continuity, particularly of stem points and understanding the distribution of stem points um, and the, the association with Western Fluvial Lakes tradition. Um, but stem points are, are certainly a marker for these early 
insights as our crescents, crescents in particular, which in that the image of that technology, there are the ones in the center. Um, those uh, are found in sites that typically date at least 11,000 years or older. Um, we actually have not found them in sites that date um, earlier than that or date um, younger than that on the island. So these have been kind of markers for this early habitation, um, even if we don't have the, the C14 dates to back it up. Um, but um, that is one, one big piece of the picture. So, you know, when you think about this and you think about this, you know, really early habitation and over 100 paleo coastal sites, and you look at this and you think, well, this is a really great place to kind of think about these early habitation, to think about, you know, how early do we see people coming into the new world? And then how are they reacting to this massive amount of climate change and, and um, sea level rise that's occurring at this, at this point in time? Um, and, you know, I can tell you that while we have these 100, over 100 paleo coastal sites, this is really only half the picture. Actually, this is really like 25% of the picture. Um, and one of the reasons why is because those four land masses that make up the Northern Channel Islands at the time period of initial habitation were not four land masses. They were one large land mass called Santa Rosé. Um, so this is an image of what this area looked like, um, what the Channel Islands, the Northern Channel Islands looked like about 15,000 years ago. Um, so you can see there the images of the current landmass that I have pointed out with those uh, black arrows. Um, and then all those kinds of light brown areas and green areas is actually the extent of landmass at 15,000 years ago. So again, this is when sea levels were 300 feet lower than they are today. Um, this was um, before you started to get a really, really quick and massive amount of inundation. Um, so this is the amount, this is what the islands look like. So when you think about trying to find these early sites, and you have to think about, well, where would some of these sites be located? We find certainly a lot of them along the coast today, but we certainly think that there's going to be a lot more of them on a lot of these areas that are inundated, that have now been inundated um, through this, this process of sea level rise after these glaciers have melted after the last glacial maximum. Um, so this is about 10 and a half thousand years ago. Um, you can see the kind of, you know, um, massive amount of reduction. Um, this is about nine and a half thousand years ago. This is when you have Anacapa is fully split off and you have um, so kind of Santa Cruz and Santa Rosa have, are, are almost split. We likely have really kinds of interesting habitats in there, probably some bays, likely estuaries, probably all sorts of, of real, real great habitats for, um, for hunting different kinds of animals. Um, and then at about 8,500 years ago, they look roughly like they do today. Those green areas um, would still have been above sea level that are submerged today. But you know, the story here is that more than 200 square kilometers of landmass have been submerged by rising seas. Um, around the, the Northern Channel Islands. It's actually 76% of the land mass has been submerged. That's crazy. That's a lot of land mass that's been submerged. So when we look and when we think about what we know on the terrestrial portion um, of, of the islands today, like I said, it really only tells 25% of the story. Um, and so when we, when we think about this and you look about, for instance, this image here shows you all of the red dots are where the, the paleocoastal sites are located um, on the islands. And then when you, um, when you look at those other shorelines, the 9,000 BP shoreline is in yellow, um, the brown is the 10,000 BP shoreline. Um, so when you think about that and you look at where those sites are located and you can just imagine what might be on those submerged areas um, of, of the islands, um, particularly one area we're really interested in is in between Santa Rosa um, and Santa Cruz because we've been finding so many more sites on Santa Cruz off of that kind of western side of Santa Cruz Island. So, um, understanding this landscape and understanding how this landscape has evolved through time is particularly important because we really don't know much about it. We really don't know how this massive inundation, I mean, certainly changed habitats, it certainly changed, um, you know, water courses and, um, and, and those types of things um, coming off of the islands, but we don't really know exactly how at this point. Um, we don't know where we might have had um, relic or estuaries that are now submerged. So these are all the things that we really, really want to find out and we have to honestly start at the very beginning. Um, and so that means that we have to practice pre-contact archeology span on the continental shelf. Um, so this is, um, the, this is a, a picture that I like to show people when I talk about underwater research, because I think when people think about underwater research, they think about strapping on a, a, a scuba tank, putting on a wetsuit, diving down. Um, that's definitely part of it sometimes. Um, this is actually from some research I did down in Baja California a number of years ago. Um, where the water is much warmer, much calmer, um, much easier to dive in. Um, out here, however, and where we've been working around the islands, um, the underwater research actually looks a little bit more like this. Um, so we're on big ships, um, we're doing coring, we're doing a lot of remote sensing. Um, we have students, these are a couple students that are helping us out here. I've got a 
colleague there, Dave Ball, in the background, helping us with this with this core that we are preparing to drop into the water. Um, a lot of times, this is what it looks like. Um, I show people this picture and say, this is really what underwater archaeology looks like. It's four o'clock in the morning, and you're staring at a screen of um, images of things that are that the 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 um, equipment that you're towing off the back of the boat is imaging the sea floor, and you're looking at pictures of it, trying to kind of find interesting or or unique features within this. Um, so this is typically what it looks like, um, and um, these are the data that we get. Now I know that if I put this up here and you didn't know that I was an archaeologist, you'd be like, "Are you doing geology? Like, what is this?" Um, so these are the data that we actually work with. Um, and um, the, the top picture there, that, that yellow picture, um, kind of the yellow line at the top, is um, images from what's called a side scan sonar. Um, so a side scan sonar images the top of the seafloor. Um, that image that's right below it there, that um, one that has all the kind of markers on it, that's actually the same section of seafloor, but that is um, imaged with what's called a sub-bottom profiler. And this is just a fascinating piece of, of equipment. What it does is shows us what's beneath the seafloor. And this is really integral for us uh, for understanding um, all different kinds of things and all different changes within that environment. Because when you look at the seafloor, you're looking at marine sediment. You're looking at the sediment that's been laid down as sea level rises kind of come up, as you're getting inundations of rivers in these different areas. We really want to get below that marine sediment. We want to know what that terrestrial sediment looks like. We want to understand where paleo channels are. We want to understand where estuaries are. Um, so to understand that, we need to get below that marine sediment. And that's what the sub-bottom profiler allows us to do. Um, it can do things, um, if you look at the bottom right-hand corner there, that shows us um, um, old paleo shorelines. So trying to understand where these paleo shorelines are to help refine the sea level curves that we have to make sure that they are relative sea level curves that we have are correct. That's a, a huge factor in, in helping us understand where on this massive 200 square kilometers that we should try to start looking for some of these sites. Um, it also helps us find things like paleo channels. So on uh, that picture there on the, the left-hand side is an image called a fence diagram, which basically has a, a whole bunch of these images of sub-bottom profilers kind of put together. And you can see there's this kind of paleo channel that you can see that's kind of showing up um, off that. It's an area off of, um, off of Santa Rosa Island, actually right there, that has this kind of paleo channel. So being able to trace this paleo channel in the offshore and seeing how it's kind of changed, changed through time. Um, so these are the kinds of data that we work with um, when we initially start to do this type of underwater research. There we go. So um, one of the projects that I've been a part of uh, for the past about five years um, is an archaeological and biological assessment of submerged landforms. And this is a, a massive project with a lot, a lot, a lot of people in it. I am just here telling you about it. It's a, a big project, um, lots and lots of colleagues in it, um, lots of people from um, archaeological colleagues, Todd Breggie, John Erlinson, um, lots of people, Dave Ball, um, and we uh, have our marine geology colleagues, marine biology colleagues, people that do GIS for us, the Native American community, lots and lots of people are involved in this. So this is definitely not a one person show. Um, I just get to be here telling you about it tonight. Um, so this project was kind of based along all those things I was telling you about is we really want to understand the paleo landscape. We want to understand these submerged landforms. We want to understand what the environment looked like um, 15,000 years ago, 16,000 years ago. Um, and in order to do that, we have to really start from the beginning. Um, so what you see on this image here are those black lines. Those are survey lines. So those are areas where we've taken out side scan um, sonar. We've taken out sub-bottom profile and we've imaged those areas. And you can see that there's um, really a lot of focus on the areas in between Santa Rosa and Santa Cruz Island um, because that area was separated a little bit later in time. And we think that those areas um, likely have a lot to offer in terms of trying to understand this landscape, um, particularly close to Santa Cruz Island. You can see there's like kind of a, a, a box, a lot of kind of crosshairs in that box there. Um, that area there is something that my colleague John Erlinson has dubbed Crescent Bay, um, likely because we've they've um, been able to find a number of crescents, this technology along Santa Cruz Island there. And this may have been a really extensive kind of um, bay or estuary area, kind of maybe wetland area um, that likely um, may have been really great for, um, for, for marine resources. Um, and then of course you have an area that's on the northern part of Santa Rosa. So we're particularly interested in that area as well. Um, for, uh, well, one of the reasons, uh, certainly, because that's where um, Arlington Springs is and some of the early the early sites um, on the Northern Islands. Um, but there's also a lot of interesting targets that are in those areas. Um, lots of different kinds of paleo channels that are kind of coming together, valleys that we're trying to kind of understand the, the, um, the formation of. 
Um, so these are some of the big areas. So we started out with a very, very broad scale survey in trying to understand really broadly what this looks like. Um, and then we had to actually narrow it down to four one kilometer squared areas. So those are those yellow boxes that you see on there. So we took a really, really broad scale looking for where do we find large paleo channels? Where are we finding big kind of um, features? Can we see paleo shorelines in this? Um, where can we kind of find these large features? Um, and then do a really, really high resolution scan of these areas because we have to go from this 200 square kilometers um, down to literally being able to take a sample from a core, which is a, a four inch diameter core. So that's like a massive amount of kind of reduction in trying to understand where do we actually want to drop this sample. Um, so we um, have uh, GIS experts who have compiled over 150 data sets to create models of areas that we should look at, look at everything from, you know, certainly archaeological sites on terrestrial portion of, of the mainland to um, hydrology patterns, to what the substrate looks like in different areas, um, how other, other research people have done in terms of biology, you know, marine biology, marine geology, um, stuff from oil and gas industry, you know, what have they found in these different areas, where can we nail it down? You know, one thing we have to be particularly cautious about with underwater work is not just what area may have been good for habitation or we, we might want to look, but we always really have to think about preservation too. Um, you know, working in areas like the Gulf of Mexico or the Gulf of California, um, where there has been a good amount of research, particularly in the Gulf of Mexico, underwater research, it's very, very different oceanographic conditions, much calmer, obviously, really, really broad, flat continental shelf. That is not the case out here. We have waves, we have great surf, um, you know, you've got, you know, good tides. Um, so that really does destroy um, pieces of that continental shelf and certainly any archaeological sites that would be on it. So we really have to kind of think about that as well. Where are areas that we can actually uh, successfully stamp, sample that may actually have preserved sites as well. So that's something that kind of plays into this too. Um, so from that kind of broad scale survey, we actually, as I mentioned, have to narrow it down to taking cores. Um, so we have to go down and find what four inch little section do we want to actually drop this core in. So on this image here, you can see those, those um, one kilometer squared uh, blue boxes there and then all those red dots where we've actually collected core data. Amazingly enough, we were supposed to collect um, like 16 cores, you know, per this proposal. Um, we actually had the ability to collect, I think it was 26 or 28 cores. This like never happens on underwater projects. Something always breaks. You always lose a couple days of research. Um, the fact that we were able to collect more data than we needed was like, nobody could believe it, um, which was fantastic. So um, how did we choose some of these areas? Well, I have kind of, which I realize now that we're all looking at this on our computers is kind of a small picture and I apologize for that. Um, but if you can look uh, kind of in the, 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 little, the little box that's, that's below Santa Cruz Island and that little image there, that's an image of a sub bottom profiler um, that really exemplifies an area that we would likely want to core in. <clears throat> and the reason for that is because you have that area that I just circled there is a paleo channel, um, it, a sediment infilled paleo channel. So you have a paleo channel. So we're interested in that for a number of reasons for understanding the environment, understanding the, the evolution of these channels through time. Also because freshwater sources are a big draw for human populations. So that is one thing that's important there. You have that other little red, red circle that just showed up there. Hopefully you can see that. Um, an area where you have changes in sediment. So one thing that the sub-bottom profiler can show um, is actually changes in sediment um, below this, this marine sediment. And what we'd really be interested in looking for are changes um, that would exemplify like a, um, an estuary sediment, maybe some kind of different lacustrine sediments, I mean some sort of different kind of sediment um, that we'd be interested in, in, in understanding that the kind of hab the, the, um, habitat that's in that area. So variations in sediment is something that we're interested in. Um, and then you have these things that are called high amplitude reflectors. What high amplitude reflectors are means that we don't know what they are. Um, it means that this is what's reflecting um, off of something that's different than the surrounding, than the context that it's surrounding. So this could be rock, uh, it could be shell, uh, it could be gas, it could be all sorts of different things. It could be you know, uh, something that's just harder or more porous or less porous than an area around it. Um, but when we look at the context surrounding this, maybe this is a, a, a small, maybe this is a, a river channel, um, maybe there's an area that has an, an estuary that's nearby, um, maybe that's a shell midden, right? So um, being able to understand what these markers are is something that's um, important, an important part of this project as well. So this is an area where we would probably drop about three cores into each one of those different markers that I mentioned. 
Um, and so what does this look like in terms of these cores? So again, going from this really broad scale down to, you know, literally just taking out some of the sediment. So um, you have here um, an image again of um, the, so there is that circle that I just put up there. Um, that is this area right off of Santa Cruz, area that we're particularly interested in. Um, it's in this one, one box, one of those boxes. So in that box, this is the core that we're looking at. It's core 6D. So it goes from the box there down to that specific core in 6D. Um, that is actually what we cored. So in that area, what we're looking at is a change in sediment. So we're like, what is that change in sediment? Um, what could that possibly mean? Um, and so from that core, this is what the actual core looks like. You have an X-ray of the core there, and then you actually have that core split open um, and photographed on the uh, left-hand side there. Um, and so we have our uh, marine geology colleagues go through and really do a, um, an analysis on the cores and trying to understand we have a, this is actually a really great core because there's a lots of different, there's a lot of different things going on. We have um, definitely marine sediment that you can see in the top part of it, but then we actually get into terrestrial sediment. So that's really exciting for us because what we can do is we can look at that and we can decide, we can uh, look at the, the properties of it. We can try to figure out what kind of um, a kind of terrestrial environment it is. Ideally try to um, actually get radiocarbon dates out of it. Um, we are um, also going to be doing um, eDNA analysis as well as pollen analysis on, on anything that we can um, from um, all these different cores. So we can really get an understanding um, of what these uh, the paleo landscape looks like again, and also what that paleo environment looks like, because that's really the base of what we need to know before we can start to really understand where sites may be located in this submerged environment. We need to actually understand that submerged environment first. Um, so that's really what this project has been focused on. Um, and it's, you know, coming towards the end, I, I really can't give you too much more information on a lot of the results from this. We're kind of just finishing it up right now. Um, but what I can tell you is that um, this uh, project has already, um, we've already published um, a number of papers on it, not archaeologically focused, and some of the methodologies we have, uh, but we've already been able to identify different paleo drainage evolutions around the Northern Channel Islands. Um, we've been able to clarify the Lake Laternary uplift rates of marine terraces around the Northern Channel Islands, which is important for understanding um, where these landscapes sit in terms of sea level rise. Um, and one thing I'll talk about in a second too, is we've been able to test and kind of develop new technologies for identification, hopefully of submerged shell mittens, and that's um, a project we're kind of embarking on now. Um, and also identifying those paleo shorelines, again, important for really helping to refine what we know about the offshore area and refining those, those, um, those sea level curves. Um, so out of this research has, has sparked a whole other group of projects that, we, that we're kind of embarking on. We have, me and my archaeology colleagues, have successfully convinced a number of people down at Scripps and UCSD that, um, who are geologists and marine geophysicists, that they should try to help us develop technologies um, that, are, uh, that are conducive to helping us do our underwater archaeological research. Um, we've been very fortunate that they've listened to us um, and that they have been um, really happy to actually try to adapt a lot of technologies that are used for oil and gas industries and for um, also for uh, different kinds of, of marine geology to try to adapt them to actually um, find specific things for archaeology um, and to actually really be involved in these projects with us. Um, we, we're, we're really fortunate that I think we're just really convincing maybe when we talk to them about this. Um, so uh, we actually, I've been working with some of the folks down at Scripps um, who we've been able to develop a, or adapt rather, a, a technology. Um, there's a, a graduate student that's working, um, Roz King, who has um, really kind of taken an interest in this and has um, started to develop these uh, adaptive technology that's used in the oil and gas industry to identify tar seeps that looks at porosity of um, of, uh, of, of the seafloor essentially, and they use it in, in oil and gas industry to identify tar seeps and hydrocarbon um, in the offshore. Um, she's been able to kind of modify this to use this, this value of porosity because ideally if you find a shell midden in the underwater environment, it's gonna have a different porosity signature than the surrounding sediment. Um, and so these are the types of signals that, that this can pick up. Um, and it really, this isn't something that's going to be kind of a slam dunk per se, but it's going to be one more tool in our toolkit, along with the other kinds of technology that we have to really help us narrow down a lot of the targets that we find. Because, you know, if you think about it, when I, I showed you those, those pictures about the different kind of context and the targets that we're looking for, some of these anomalies we're looking for, we're not sure what they are. You can get hundreds of them in the offshore area um, when you're doing these projects. So really trying to understand what these anomalies are and having other lines of data to kind of consider is extremely important. Um, 
So that's one thing that we're doing, um, which has been um, funded by the National Park Service, which has been really great. Um, so we're developing that. We had a very successful test of it um, just actually last week. Um, everybody was all you know, masked up and everything and offshore. Um, and then um, we've actually also just um, uh, received a NOAA grant um, for paleolandscapes, paleoecology, and cultural heritage on the Southern California continental shelf. So this, again, large project, lots of different people involved, my museum, um, as well as the La Brea Tar Pit Scripps. Um, University of North Carolina, Wilmington, University of Oregon, San Diego State, um, Shumash, um, National Park Service, BOEM, everyone's really kind of pitching in. And this is really kind of an extension of the project that we're doing, using some of those data and actually going back to some of the areas that we had really wanted to visit, um, but were not able to for one reason or another. Um, so this project is one that takes these new technologies. So there is the the controlled source electromagnetic technology that I was just mentioning. This is that new technology that we are fortunate enough to have convinced um, some of the folks at Scripps to um, to help us uh, kind of develop or really develop for us. I the technology is very is it's very it's very advanced. It's not something that I can do. I just I just um, we just try to write grants to get to, to get money to to um, to to get these guys to help develop all these algorithms to modify this equipment. Um, but uh, so you can see everyone there on the boat. That's our, our test from about a week ago. They are testing out those this piece of equipment um, that is looking to, to collect these different kinds of values for um, submerged sites within the offshore. Um, we're going to be using also an ROV as part of this, as opposed to coring a pretty beefy ROV, ROV that has um, sampling capabilities. Um, and we are going to continue looking um, for areas. Um, on the previous slide, you saw there was areas off of Actually, I can go back. Areas off of Santa Cruz, those kind of yellow boxes are areas that we're particularly interested in. So some areas that we've already been as well, some areas off of the mainland that we're particularly interested in. One of the big new additions that we're looking for this time is we're really interested in tar seeps. So we know that tar um, and um, you know, asphalt has been particularly important for um, you know, uh, human groups you know, throughout time. I mean, people have, you know, since Neanderthals have used you know, tar to, to to, for hafting. Um, and so we know that this was used and an important resource for peoples in this area. So there are lots and lots and lots of tar seeps um, off of the Channel Islands. Um, there are no tar seeps that we know of on the Channel Islands, but we do know that there are some offshore the Channel Islands. Um, and we know there are a lot of submerged tar seeps um, in the area. If anyone's been on any of the beaches in these areas in Santa Barbara, Coal Oil Point, you get tar on your feet. Um, and these are really great areas, um, tar seeps, tar pits, breas are really great areas to look at paleoecology. Um, so we brought on my colleagues from the tar pits who are going to be on this project with us and offshore we're looking specifically for some of those same things as before, those, those um, paleo channels, paleo estuaries, those kinds of things, but also tar seeps are going to be a big focus for us. Um, and so I have here a picture of some of the, a lot of people when they think about tar seeps, they might think of the megafauna, they think of La Brea tar pits, um, you know, they think of, you know, mastodon and short-faced bear and all these really interesting, you know, um, Rancho La Brea and fauna. I'm sure that would be super cool to find that in the offshore, but what's really cool that we think about a lot of these um, offshore tar seeps is they actually have a lot of microfossils. And these microfossils are really integral in understanding paleoecology. So just as an example, um, in that lower, lower picture there, these are a bunch of things that you can find these kind of microfossils in these 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 tar seeps. So that's a leaf fragment that's kind of going from the left, kind of going clockwise. Um, rodent tooth. Um, you've got an, an insect leg, a rodent claw, um, a beetle wing. You've got a juniper seed there over on the on the, the bottom, kind of far right. That's a freshwater clamshell, and then you got a lizard jaw. Um, so these are all the, the these kinds of microfossils are really the things that we're interested in understanding um, and kind of capturing out of these kind of tar seeps from the offshore area that can really help us um, really understand that that paleo, that paleoecology a lot more than we do. We have. Um, at, at the, the um, La Brea Tar Pits, which is part of the museum that I work at as well. Um, we've um, just brought on a, um, a um, paleobotanist um, who is going to um, you know, look at the, any kinds of um, you know, plant remains that are in this. So we're really, really excited about this project moving forward. It just started. Um, it's it's going to be going on for like the next three years. Um, so this is kind of a, a new chapter in that project and a continuation of this underwater research and of really trying to understand um, these, uh, the, the paleoecology and the paleo landscape um, of the Northern Channel Islands. Um, and it's a really exciting chapter um, in, in the research that's occurring out there. And hopefully within the next few months, we'll be able to share some of the information that we've gotten from the last uh, about five years we've been working out there in the offshore. Um, and we'll hopefully have some really exciting research to share with you in the future. 
Um, so I just have some thanks up here. Um, as I mentioned, you know, this research is something that is um, a lot, a lot of people contribute to this research. It's a really, really big collaborative effort, um, which is absolutely wonderful. It's, um, you know, I've learned so much over the past uh, five years in working with my colleagues, um, both from an archaeological standpoint, but also, I mean, all sorts of cool things in terms of marine geology and marine biology and things that just, I think, make the science uh, a lot better. So um, I just want to really thank um, everyone that's been working with me and supporting um, these projects um, over the past five years. And with that, I will open it up to questions. Great. Well, thank you, Amy. That was so exciting. We've got so many questions for everybody, um, from everybody. So I don't know if we'll be able to get to all of them, but um, he here we go. So one of the questions from Bobby Offen was, um, what were the crescents used for and, and how are they different from points? Yeah, that's actually a really good question. Um, so there is a little bit of um, back and forth about this, uh, but one of, I think probably one of the more um, prevailing theories is that they were used um, as kind of a transverse point. So kind of if they were, if the crescents were like this, kind of half it essentially like that. Um, and we think that they probably were used um, for hunting different kinds of waterfowl, maybe as a way to kind of stun them or knock them out of the air. Um, and the reason that 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 that's kind of a prevailing theory is because of you find them a lot of times um, you find them on the mainland um, near kind of Pleistocene lakes and these kinds of um, these kinds of lake environments, um, and also um, on the uh, on the islands um, near to an area where we think that there likely was some sort of estuary. We've actually found a number of them as well. Um, so um, uh, in association with um, with bird bones. Um, and not always, but there have been areas where we have found that. So that is kind of one of the prevailing theories is that they were likely used as kind of a transverse point and probably more for kind of knocking, knocking a bird out of the air. Very interesting. Thank you. So here's another question um, from Glenn Duvall, and this is about the, um, the sediment cores. So he's asking, so is, is the depth of sediment hundreds of meters worth of silt? Oh, that's a good question. So, um, yeah, so I forgot to mention that. So the cores themselves, they only go down. Um, and so we use what's called a vibra core. And basically what it does is a vibra core, it has the, the tube that you saw in those. And then there's a machine at the top that literally physically vibrates very, very hard. Um, once it gets onto the, onto the seafloor, it kind of keeps it straight up and then it vibrates it down. The, the, depending upon the sediment out there, out around the Channel Islands, it's very sandy. So depending upon the sediment, um, how far down it can go can really vary. Um, the furthest that we've been able to get down, so this is about through about 80, um, anywhere from 80 to 100 um, meters uh, down, so depth, the depth to the seafloor. Um, but then the actual depth beneath the seafloor, we've only been able to get down um, around the Channel Islands to about two and a half, about two and three quarters of meters. So we actually look, and that's part of the idea that I mentioned in terms of preservation and areas we can actually sample. So the areas that we look to sample um, in those sub bottom images, we actually look for areas that only have anywhere from about ideally a meter or even less of marine, marine sediment so we can actually get into that terrestrial sediment. So that core that you saw in there, I believe that that core was about two meters. So you saw about half of it was um, marine sediment and then the other half was terrestrial sediment. Okay. All right. So I'm going to ask the last question now. Um, and so <clears throat> this is from Aaron Kreisberg. And the question is, in regards to the folks on the islands 13,000 plus years ago, would they be called Chumash or pre-Chumash or something else? That's a good question, actually. Um, and I think that there is some thought. So the, the Chumash um, have a, a very um, ancient longevity um, on, in, in this area. Um, and certainly if you um, understand and if you, uh, you um, uh, think about kind of tribal narratives, um, you know, they, so Chumash have been here since time immemorial. Um, and there is certainly some scientific evidence to, to, to back that up. There is some evidence that some of the original peoples that were on, um, on the islands are actually the ancestors of some of living Chumash today. So um, whether or not, uh, you know, I think, I think that the term Chumash um, certainly does um, conjure up this kind of a particular kind of culture, um, you know, kind of the a culture that you may think of. Um, but there is certainly some, um, some evidence that it may be, um, that it may be descended from the same peoples that initially um, occupied the island. Um, and certainly um, in thinking about kind of um, uh, tribal narratives, that would certainly be the case, yes. 
Wonderful. Wow, there's so much so much to learn. <laughs> there's so much to know. Well, I, I wanted to say um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Amy Gusick, for this seriously thrilling um, presentation tonight. I um, really enjoyed it, and, and it seems like everybody else out there did too. And I want to thank you all, everybody, for attending tonight. This has been uh, just a wonderful night. It's our first night with uh, our seven-part seminar series. Please join us next Thursday. Um, where we're going to move to another one of UCSB's reserves, the Carpinteria Salt Marsh Reserve. And Dr. Kevin Lafferty will present uh, his talk, which is titled, Do Parasites Run the Natural Reserve System? And uh, his, his research is, is, is all about parasites and, and all kinds of other things, too. So um, we hope to see you again next week um, for more interesting um, research that happens at our reserves. And again, thank you, Dr. Gusick. Thank you, Jay. And uh, thanks to everybody for joining. I really appreciate it and have a wonderful evening. Yeah, and I wanted to throw out there too, sorry, I know that probably didn't get to lots and lots of questions that we have up there. So anyone, honestly, feel free to shoot me an email. Um, I'm just agusick at nhm.org. You can also just go on to anthropology at Natural History Museum Los Angeles, and you can find my email address there. So please feel free to shoot me emails if you have questions. I'm always happy to talk about this. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thank you. <laughs>